Very short chapter. A verse, rather. But I want to read it to you, and you probably think, as I read it to you, what in the world is he going to do with this? For Demas hath forsaken thee, having loved, me, loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, and Titus to Dalmatia. Paul is in prison, his last imprisonment, and he knows that he's going to go to meet his maker. If you look up in the in the in verse six, you'll see you'll see what I'm talking about. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also which love his appearing. Do your diligence to come shortly unto me. And then that statement, for Demas hath forsaken me. I want you to recall also the story of the rich farmer who had a real crop, and it was a big crop. And he wondered what he was going to do with that crop that he had. He said, I know what I'll do. I'll build my, I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build greater. And then he says to himself, So take thy knees. Live and be merry. Eat and be merry. For tomorrow you may die. <laughs> and that night, Jesus said, the Lord came to him and took him home. I thought about that when I read this story of Demas. Demas was uh, a fellow that had worked with Paul. And that name probably is the first time you've heard this word Demas in your life. Who in the world is Demas? We have a lot of names that we can look at and we can remember and, re and recall in, in the past. We can remember uh, who uh, Billy Graham is. We can remember who George Bush is, we can remember who Michael Jordan is, those names come to, to us and we remember who they are. But, and there may be a lot of, a lot of uh, names from the Bible that you might remember, just automatically. You think about Moses, you know who Moses was, then the children out of Israel. You think about David, the man who had a golden voice and a golden harp and could play music as well as fight the enemies of God. And you know the name of Jesus. You know the name of Paul. You know the name of Peter. But what do you know about Demas? Do you know anything at all about Demas? Not much. There are only three verses in the Bible in which Demas appears. Those three verses tell all that we need, all that we know about Demas. In the little small letter to Philemon, Paul tell, call, calls him his fellow worker. And in Colossians 4.14, Paul simply calls him Demas. And here, where I have read you, from 2 Timothy 14, Paul says, Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. For Demas hath forsaken me, 
having loved this present world and is departed to doubt me, uh, departed from me. As I look at this about Demas, I find that there are three truths about Demas that we ought to know. I don't think it's a good thing that Demas did. Demas was Paul's associate, his fellow worker. Now we know about Titus, we know about Timothy, and those names are not strange to us. But Demas is a strange name because all we know about him was that he forsook Paul when Paul was in prison, probably for the last time and probably just before his, his crucifixion. But there are three truths that are revealing about you and me and the part of us that could be Demas. A good beginning is not enough. I have witnessed some good beginnings in my lifetime. I can remember when I was baptized. I was baptized with a man. I was seven years old. I was baptized with a man, and uh, he didn't change his pants when he went into the water, and he left his billfold in his pants. And the preacher, after he had baptized him, said, this man is very serious because he even wanted his billfold to be baptized. I can remember that from that way back yonder. But I also remember what happened to him. I never saw him again after his baptism. He never came back to our church, but he was baptized. I've often wondered what happened to that guy. He had a good beginning. He started where everyone who wants to be a Christian must start at. He started with his baptism. But then he left. And nobody ever saw him. At least I didn't see him ever again. Didn't know who he was. But you know, all of us understand that it's helpful to have a good beginning. Every football coach in the nation understands the importance of that very first game and you're getting a win, a win. That's the reason that Georgia, Florida State, and all of those guys look all across the country and find some sucker school who wants $300,000 to come and play them so they win the first game. Did you know that? Because it's a good beginning. It sounds good when you have whipped the school 46 to nothing. And that's something that, that, that we know is the truth because of that. But a good, and it's also good for us to understand that it's essential. A good foundation is essential to building a house. As much as Building, uh, putting in a good foundation is essential as much as, as the good beginning game win is, is, we know that God has, begin, has good beginnings, wants us to have good beginnings, but they don't assure, ensure good endings. <coughs> Did you know that? I've pulled and I've pulled and I've pulled. Mama told me one time I, I'd, I'd be better off if I, if I didn't even watch ball games because I always pulled for the underdog and most of the time they lost. And that's about exactly what happens here with Timothy, with, with Demas. There is a good beginning. He worked with Paul. He was with Paul wherever Paul went. There's another example in the Bible. There's several examples in the Bible of where you have a good beginning, but you don't have a good ending. You remember the first king of Israel? Now, don't say what I'm talking about when the kingdom divided under Rehoboam. The, they divided into two kingdoms. 
Judah in the south, and Israel in the north. And the king in, of Israel in the north was Jeroboam the first. There were two of those guys named Jeroboam who were kings. This one was the first one. He had a good beginning. He went, went he, he, he brought everybody together in the northern kingdom. They crowned him and made him their king. But you know, one of the first acts he did led him away from that good beginning. He said, you don't need to go to Jerusalem to worship anymore. You don't have to go down there. I'm going to put an altar at Dan, and I'm going to put one at Beersheba, and that's as far as you need to go. Don't go all that big, long trip to worship God. Come to these two places. When Jesus came, we could go to, we could worship God anywhere we wanted to after Jesus came. But that's what he did at the very beginning, not the props out from under had a, he had a good beginning when he was crowned. Good man. High, high in the hierarchy under Rehoboam. And then when Rehoboam fired him, he went to Egypt, he came back, he became a king. As a king. And he went down. Success in any field does not come by rehearsing yesterday's triumphs and victories. It comes by committing yourself to doing your very best today. And that's what you did this morning. You committed yourself to doing what is the best activity because you got up and you came to church on the Lord's day. And you're sin, you're here in this place today. That's the best thing. You had a good beginning. But it doesn't ensure success. And it's not enough. As I look at Demas and the way he's departed, he, Paul says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, he wanted to love God at the beginning. He had a good <coughs> beginning with Paul. He traveled with Paul. He dedicated himself to the ministry, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he departed. And he found out that loving the world is too much. Too much is a pathway to trouble. Our church, our churches today are filled with Christians who act like the world, who think like the world, who talk like the world, and who love the things of the world. Too many people in the church pews today are like that. I've seen people come to church and be red hot for Jesus Christ. And then I've seen them leave. And I've seen them go back to doing exactly what they were. And did you know that today, today there will be some pastors that are fired and voted out of the pulpit in the Southern Baptist Convention because of this mindset in the church. Success has to be for them more baptisms. It has to be more buildings. It has to be more budgets. And those folks who vote the preacher out don't realize that the church is best served from the pew than from the pulpit. You, you gain people to come here. They come here because you are their friend. They become a part of us because you have said something to them. Don't go out of here and say that the preacher didn't do, do so and so. The preacher is the reason that everything is going awry. Because they come because you are here. 
and you meant something to them, and they want you to, and they want to be here in this church because of who you are. I want you to listen to a quotation that I got from out of the Christian Herald by Bob Chubala. And this is what he says. Americans love sound bites, which distill life's complexities into pre-digested bits of information. They've already got it the way they want it, and they just give you the sound bite. That's all you get. You get it on television. So a lot of you in here, a lot of you in here watch Fox uh, News channel like I do, and they'll give you one, they'll hook you into a, into staying on Fox television by giving you a little sound bite so you're going to see what that means a little bit later. Oh, that's what he's talking about. Sound bites fit our frenzied lifestyle. We don't have to slow down to read or listen or consider or think as we work up the corporate ladder, hustle through two jobs, or juggle a career with our children's schedules. The frenzy of American culture is so pervasive, even Christian volunteers get, get caught up in the futile madness. Pastors have difficulty finding volunteers to staff vital ministries. Christians say this church makes too many demands on their time. It's as if the world is sucking believers out of the pews and into the maelstrom of, of materialism. And I think you find, if you find one thing here that is about Demas, that's it. For Demas, Paul said, hath forsaken me, and having loved this present world, I want to be where I, where I, love, I want to be. And if it's not church, I don't go. Let me give you an example of, from, a, from a church that I'm talking about. I, won't, I can't ever forget this. Uh, one Sunday, when I was at Norman Park, we had, uh, we had a good crowd of folks there on that Sunday morning. And uh, there was to be a softball tournament for the 8th grade boys down in Thomasville, Georgia. Guess what happened to our congregation that Sunday morning? They were in Thomasville. Lots of them were in Thomasville. Now I'm telling you that because I, I saw it with my own eyes. And I couldn't help but think about Demas. Because it's more important to play softball, to teach those kids to play softball, than it is to teach those kids how to live. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. You come to this church in order to find out how to live. You come to this church seeking good fellowship to encourage you to go out in, into the world to live in the right way. But it was more important to do softball than it was to do church. Folks, loving the world too much is a pathway to trouble, and it'll get there. But look at the third thing that I, that I see in Demas. And that is that no one is immune to what happened to Demas. Not even Jimmy Bowles. <laughs> it could happen to me. Because I like, I like the good things of this world, just like everybody else. You know, I mean, on a good day like today, if it were, if the wind weren't blowing, it'd be a wonderful time to go fishing. Look at the sun. Look at the look at the look at the time of the year. The, the speckled perch on bed now. The bass are just coming off bed now. The brim are getting ready to go to bed. I'm telling you, today would be a good day to go fishing. But I woke up this morning 
knowing that that temptation would never find fulfillment in my life because there was a greater need in me to know how to live my life and how to react with other people than for me to go fishing today. I, I, look, at, I look at all of this and I realize that each day by our decisions and by our deeds we determine what kind of epitaph is going to be placed upon our spiritual lives in this world. There are two epitaphs in these verses that I read to you just a few moments ago. I want you to look first at the epitaph that will go on the cemetery uh, stone of Demas. His, his epitaph would have read, he loved the world more than he loved God. I want you to listen to this next epitaph or look back up in the verse. For I am ready to be offered the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight and I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day and not to me only, but unto all who love is his appearing. You can have that written on your gravestone, or you can have what Demas did. You love the present world. And as I look at that, that's not bad. You know what I'm saying? I can remember when I had to go to the get out in the early morning hours and have to go to the barn and sit down on a stool and pull that stool up under a cow's back hip and pull on her on her uh, bladder and, and get the milk out. And I could do it with both hands at one time. Learned it really well as a young boy. You know what I'm saying? I can remember that time. The days times were, you don't have to do it. You just open your pocketbook, you go to the store and you pay a lot more than you used to, but you pay for it and you go home and your milk's there. You don't have to come home and strain the milk and come home and scream, get the butter, uh, the, the fat off the top of the milk and, and then churn the butter and have that ready and drink milk, the milk that's left. You, all of that is important, but it is not an absolutely necessary. There's one thing that is absolutely necessary to get to the marker that will be on Paul's grave. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. I think that all of us in here can see that Demas had a problem. That Demas turned away from doing what God wanted him to do. I've often wondered and often thought about what would happen up in heaven when we get there. And God says to us, I see that you were a church member, but you left it. You got tired of it. I see that you have been baptized, but then you got tired of it. It's amazing, isn't it? Demas has left me. He left me for the world. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our God, a loving God, who keeps us active, who keeps us going. Thank you so much for that. But our Father, I pray that we may understand that even in church, in our church work, in our church going, we have to find ourselves beating the air, so to speak, boxing with shadows, boxing shadows. 
I pray that you would help us to lay down such activity and to recognize that it is our job to be where your word is preached with other Christians who love you, love you just as much as we love you. I thank you for this church and I thank you for the way they, they come and they attend the church. But Father, let us remember that a good beginning doesn't always mean a good ending. Thank you for letting us know this truth by your word. If there's anyone here who wants to accept Christ as his Savior, Lord, prick his heart today so he can come and join this band of people who have come to worship God and who come Sunday, day after day, Sunday after Sunday, to worship you. Thank you for being our God and our Savior. In Jesus' name.